Welcome to Deacon Harold Burke Sivers Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar, where Deacon Harold and guests explore our Catholic faith through passionate discussion. Get ready as Deacon Harold and his diverse guests bring an array of knowledge and life to Catholic teaching. You are watching Deacon Harold Burke Sivers Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar. Three, two, same fire of Christ in the hearts of Catholics by sharing the truth of our faith in a compelling manner, and that involves you. So, if you would like to see how you can get involved with the Evangelion's mission or help us out by donating, head to our website at evangelion.co.nz and check us out. If you want to be the first to find out about events we're running and uh, content we're putting out, subscribe to our mailing list and join the Evangelion family. But coming back to this podcast, Curiously Catholic, here we pick the brains of Catholic enthusiasts to try and work out how to be Catholic in contemporary times. My name is Dominic Malgeri, and in this episode we have, again, Deacon Harold Burke Sievers. How are you, uh, Deacon Harold? I'm doing well. It's great to be with you. Great to be back. Wish I was there in person, but... You know, you got you got to uh, do what you can do. Yeah, the uh, the uh, bubbles are being created and popping all the time at the moment with uh, like Australia, for example. But uh, we'll get there in the end, I'm sure. Uh, it's quite a complicated complicated situation we're in, eh? No, it certainly is. Uh, it very going? very interesting time uh, in the culture and in the church. So, mm. how's it going over there in the states? Oh, well, things are opening up. You know, finally, my state is one of the states that kind of were the last one to come on board with, you know, not wearing the masks and all that kind of stuff. But uh, so we're slowly coming out of it. But still, even though the masks aren't mandated anymore, we still see people in grocery stores, even walking around outside wearing the mask. You know, yeah, um, yeah. so, uh, you know, people's comfort levels are different places. Uh, the only place where it's still mandated now is on the uh, air travel. So any any kind of public transportation, the bus or airplanes or anything like that, you still have to wear them. But uh, yeah. for the most part, we're, we kind of seem to be on the other side of it. Yeah, same thing in New Zealand. If you're catching public transport, you have to wear the mask. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, a lot of fun just uh, seeing all the different masks people are wearing. I've, I've quite enjoyed that. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a guy who had a, like, um, like a cowboy kind of do-rag thing, but it was, actually, it was actually a mask that went around his ears. And I was like, this guy, he knows how to wear a mask. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. People, have been, people are definitely having fun with it. Yeah, and you, you know, in a sense, you might as well. You know, since uh, in some place, if you have to wear them, you know, you might as well have uh, have some fun with it. So yeah, yeah. And uh, last time you were talking to us, you said you were com you were finishing writing up your sixth book. How's that coming along? Yeah, still working on it. Um, it's uh, building a civilization of love, a Catholic response to racism. Oh, and wow. uh, right now, I'm working on the hardest chapter. The one I'm spending the most time on, because in this particular chapter, I'm looking at three different movements that are kind of finding their way into the Catholic faith. And so I want to respond to those, why those are not authentically Catholic responses. One of them is the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. um, the, another one is liberation theology. And the other one is critical race theory. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm actually reading right now. Uh, the book on critical race theory, which is actually by the people who developed critical race theory. So it's not people saying, here's what critical race theory says. I want to hear from the people themselves what it says. And I'll tell you, uh, the more I dive into this book, because I've already started writing my analysis of it, um, the, the more I see how worthless it is oh. um, and why the church would have nothing to do with it. And so I'm going to give a very um, thorough a Catholic look at it because I'm, I'm not approaching it from because in the states now people are approaching CRT from a political perspective from a educational perspective from an anthropological perspective but I'm going to address it from a Catholic faith perspective mm. you know so so some people may criticize it how can you just look at this and this and this and so I'm, I, the, the book is called Catholic response to racism so I'm looking at the Catholic perspective. You want, you want another perspective? Fine. There's some great materials out there, but my book's not going to be one of them. 
I'm focused on the Catholic faith. Yeah. So uh, and, and so I because I, I want to be thorough. Um, that's why it's taken. And, and I and critical race theory of, of those three things, that was the one I was least familiar with. So I have to really familiarize myself with it so I can talk intelligently about it. Man, that's uh, that's really uh, inspirational. Um, I've tried doing that with a few things, um, and often it just goes right over my head. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna have to listen to people who interpret it for me later because it's yeah, because especially when you look at um, some of the things they say here, it's like, wait, what does that mean? But the, see, the thing is, th and this is why learning the faith is important. If and if you're gonna do it at a professional level. Like, like what I'm doing, you have to have degrees in, in, in theology or philosophy mm. um, because the language that's used here, I'm familiar with it. I understand it. But but, but most people reading this are going to be like, what do they mean when they say that? When, yeah. it, when they see dialectical materialism, what is that? Well, I know what it is. <laughs> you know? Um, but so my job is to take that language and parse it in such a way so that people, the everyday person in the pew can understand what this is, um, what is the thinking behind it, what is the history behind it, and why we as Catholics need to avoid it, oh. and and that's what I th that's why it's 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 you know because uh, I want to make sure I'm fair that I'm representing uh, the positions well and not just like lambasting them out of emotion. Yeah. I want to know here's what they say, here's the source documentation, here's what they say for the about themselves, and then here's what the Catholic teaching is. Yeah, I guess there's lots of we can draw from that little bit you just said on like a, um, apologetics on any topic really. Uh, you've got to really get to the, the heart of the topic so you can actually uh, come to grips with it and pull out the details and come up with some good um, responses which are actually life giving and fruitful. Um, yeah, that's really cool. We'll have to um, we'll have to get you back on when you finish the book because I mean, I personally like I find like the whole concept of race just a really interesting thing i have a bit of an anthropological background in my uh, first degree um and I, i've always been really interested in that sort of stuff so um we're looking forward to that book coming well, out well that, that it is it is very interesting and i'm approaching it from two perspectives so um when you talk about race there's the the skin color race that differentiate that differentiates people but then there's cultural right so for example one of the things I'm looking at the, in the book is slavery in the Old Testament. Okay, uh, so when, when they met slavery there, slavery had nothing to do with color. It had right. nothing to do with not not like this in, in our country in, in the United States. Um, when they talked about slavery, it was cultural. It was cult. So so the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites, not because they were a different color, but because they were a different culture, which is still racism. Mm. Which is still racism, but it's not the racism that we would normally think of. We think about colors of different skin and, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, or when the Israelites had slaves, okay, they weren't chattel slaves because there's there's mm. many, many, and I'm going to quote them all, many, many, many places in the scriptures that, that uh, says that God doesn't like the idea of uh, enslaving another person. So it's more of an indentured servitude. In fact, for example, there would be a, a family that would have, see, three or four kids, and they have a fifth kid. And that child, they just can't afford to have another child. The child would starve to death. So instead of the child dying, they give that child to a family, and that child would work for that family. Now, the maximum amount of time they could work was seven years. Because whenever the Jubilee year came around, one of the things you had to do during the Jubilee is free all the slaves. right? So every time it was a Jubilee year, you would free all the slaves. And uh, the, the slaves could also have become members of the family. They could have inheritance rights. And if they were mistreated, they could take the person to court. You know, So, so, so it wasn't slavery the way yeah. we think of it. But I have to draw all that out um in the book which which i'm doing mate i'm really looking forward to this book <laughs> i only just found out you're writing it and now I'm, I'm really into it um but yeah i think this is really good especially because the topic we're continuing is um being like being made in his image in the image of god and i think whereas we started talking about this and we're going to continue on talking about like men and women uh, there is a real truth about um you know different races we're all made in the image and likeness of god and like i think pope john paul ii kind of touched on this is like 
there are no borders, you know, and even in scriptures, no man, no woman, no gen Jew and Gentile. We're all made in the image of God. We are just creation. And like even in my in my previous degree in religious studies and theology, one thing that struck me is that uh, like in Hebrew, there's no term for Jews to refer to themselves as Jews because that was a name yeah. that was given to them so that they could be studied and categorized. And they are just the people of God, which aren't we all, um, thanks to our Lord uh, Jesus. But um, yeah, yeah bringing it back to finishing off the topic we started on men and women i wanted to talk more about um i guess maleness and femaleness and how we see that in a catholic context i've just um i'm nine days into uh the consecration to saint joseph i've got a little fraternity going and uh we're all really really into it and mate if you haven't done this for those listening if you haven't done this you haven't looked into it start looking into it uh, do it maybe get in contact with me I'll, I'll point you in the right direction it's really good stuff because uh, like saint joseph hasn't really been developed as um, his role in the holy family and it's just so much is coming to light and just like you know so relatable to me uh, and one thing that i thought was really interesting is the fact that um you know the role of father uh, they talk. They talk about uh, kingship of uh, of uh, Joseph and knighthood, and but then we've also got like uh, Our Lady, who's the Madonna. Uh, she's the Queen of Heaven, and there's all these words that we're familiar with, like kings, queens, knights, etc. But like nowadays, there's not really a reference point for them. So I was hoping you could maybe expound on a few of those things. It's like, why are these necessary for us to understand maleness and femaleness? Well, it's important to understand it because uh, that's how God created us. You know, Genesis 127, male and female, he created them. Right. And, and so. Um, so but what 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 does that mean? Because you're right. We're, we're so confused in our culture today when it comes to gender identity. You know, there's there's some cities in the United States where you can have up to 60 different genders, hmm. you know, or have no gender at all. You could be what's called gender neutral. Um uh, or binary or something like that. They have all these different names now, but but what we have to come back to is God's plan. Male and female, he created them. Let's take a look at that, uh, what's going on here. So when the church, let, let, let's look at male, let's look at female first. Let's look at female first. Uh, I think I mentioned before that um, there's a reason why God created the woman last, right? I mean, she, she's not created second, after the man, like, like an afterthought, she's created last because after her, God stops and takes a rest, right? Um, because she is the life giver and the life bearer. She shares that beautiful intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Now, where does that idea come from? So when we think that God creates, God doesn't have any gender, right? Mm. I mean, we, we, Jesus has told us, has uh, instructed us to call God Father. Our Father, that's the whole prayer is about. And we, and we have the Holy Spirit um, who um, overshadowed the Blessed Virgin Mary, episkiazo in Greek, which w means to overshadow. In fact, it's the same word that's used in the Septuagint for the, the glory cloud, the Shekinah, glory cloud coming over the Ark of the Covenant. It's the same word. And, and so we have these kind of masculine images, but God himself has no gender Right. I mean, he's God. Right. So so so. How, so but yet he says male and female that comes from the one God without any gender creates two genders. What's going on here? We have to look beyond gender and look deep into the heart of God. So when the church talks about the inner life of God, when the church talks about God, first of all, the church can only talk about God by analogy. Right. Yeah. By by what's been revealed to us about the nature of who God is. Yeah, yeah. Because to fully understand God, we have to be God. And that ain't happening. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so we can only understand what's been revealed to us about God. So we know that God exists as a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. And we know that the, the God shares life within that Trinity. And the church uses um, language such as circumcision or divine perichoresis. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in the East. And all that means is the, the God's inner workings, God's inner intelligibility, God's 
uh, how how when, when Jesus says the Father and I are one, well, they're not the same person, but they share the same nature. Yeah. So how is the Father in the Son and in the Holy Spirit? And how is the Holy Spirit in the Son and the Father? And how is Jesus in the Father? <laughs> See, it's that is that eternal yeah. relationship of love and life and intimacy. The Father generates the Son. Right, he, he's the only begotten Son of God. The love between the Father and the Son generates the Holy Spirit, who they they give everything of themselves to each other, and 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 they so each of the persons gives everything back to the to the other two persons. Mm. So it's this incredible dynamic relationship of love and life and intimacy and union. Right, it, it now. We would call that God's heart, okay? okay? Not heart meaning the organ that pumps blood through the body, but when the, the, is the, uh, uh, the Hebrew word leb, okay? Leb for heart means that's the place where your desire for God lives within you. So we're talking about this is the, the very heart, if you will, of who God is, this relationship of love. God is complete, total, perfect love. Now, when he goes to create woman, okay, I, this again, I'm hypothesizing here because we, we can only talk about God by analogy. I think God pulled from his heart when he created the woman. Oh, yeah. See, that's why we say things. The woman is the heart of love. She's the heart of the home. She's the heart of the family. Um, you know, so God pulls from his beautiful heart to create this one who becomes the heart Right, the, the the heart of the family, the soul of the family, um, you know, she why because she's the life giver, and the life bearer, and she can conceive within her own body, you know, uh, life, in cooperation with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a way that is impossible for us men. Mm. That's not how God created us. That's not who God created us to be. So there's this beautiful intimacy that a woman has by the very nature of how God created her as a life giver and the life bearer. And so when you talk about human characteristics, you know, women are built, not just physically built, not just emotionally, mentally built, but spiritually also built differently than men. Mm. And it's those differences that complement each other. And it's precisely because of those differences that they're in those distinctions that they're able to have unity. <laughs> That's awesome. So let me talk about the guy. So when God created man or male, he, he pulled from the, 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 this heart for the woman, but see the heart, if it exists outside the body, can't live, right? It has to be something surrounding it and protecting it. So I think when he created man and this, again, I, I get this clue from Genesis, where he says he, he he put man in the garden to till and to keep it, okay. And I talked about this last time. The words till and a, a keep are abad and shamar, and he do, Hebrew means serve, protect, and defend. Mm. So um, we talk about uh, how does God um, witness to the world? How how does God manifest Himself in the world? Okay. Um, we, we we talk about the uh, the the it's called the economic trinity, not supply and demand, right? But oikoinomia in Greek means the workings of. So how does God work in the world? And so He creates man and gives him the specific task to serve, protect, and defend everything that's entrusted to him, and because that's what those words mean in Hebrew: serve, protect, and defend. So He's given His mission, His calling, His vocation. But what He's supposed to serve and protect and defend? Primarily, His wife, the heart of love. See, so you have this beautiful outer life that protects and serves that beautiful inner life. You see, and it's and it's that beautiful interaction in an earthly way. Now I'm not. Now I'm talking about man and woman that it reflects something of God, but it's that complementarity between the man and the woman in their physiology, in their um, the in their uh, spirituality. Yeah. that beautifully complement and in a sense perfect each other 
And it's in that union together that they're able to have, uh, that they're able to witness to the power of God in the world. Yeah. yeah. Because man by himself, that's why I said it's not good for man to be alone because God, God himself exists as a family, as a communion of persons. Mm. You see? So man by himself makes no sense. So she's there to compliment. And it's that beautiful complementarity that then shows something of God. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Now, what about monks and nuns? You say, oh, that's great, Deacon. What about monks and nuns? Hold on now. Uh, we're not going to be married in heaven the way we were married on earth. <laughs> we're, right. we're not. Because Christ is the eternal bridegroom giving life to his bride forever in heaven. Well, monks and nuns, and priests, of course, symbolize that on earth. The priest uh, is in, in, in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, the high priest, who's giving life to Christ, bride, the church on earth through the sacraments, most especially in the Holy Eucharist and the Sacrament of Reconciliation. The nuns represent the, the, the bride of Christ in heaven, right? And so that's why they wear the, they wear the veils, All because right. that's their wedding veil. They, so, so they're witnessing to what our life is going to be like with God forever in heaven, continue receiving love and life from Christ, our eternal bridegroom in heaven forever. Mm -hmm. So they witness that power on earth. Man, this is, this is awesome. This is, I mean, this is our Catholic faith. Yeah. You see, 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 so what's happening in the culture, the culture is pushing against that, pushing against that because they're, they're, you, they're, they're misusing terms. And that's what they're really, really good at, misusing, misrepresenting terms. So in their mind, equality means unless you're equal, in order to be equal, you have to be the same. Yeah, yeah. See, so equality and sameness are conflated within our culture today. And mm. that's just not true. Equal does not mean the same. Yeah. So uh, what I'm getting that what you're saying from this, especially when you brought up the... Uh contrast of monks and nuns to married life is there is more to being a man and a woman than what you can produce and what you can see there's some like there's a there's a, a difference in essence and in interior life and in the last episode i think you said you could make an argument for um to say that like uh like women are in fact better than men is that in the sense because women are the heart and drawn from the heart is that what you were getting at there yeah. So, so what I, what I mean is this, um, is that in, in the, in the Genesis narratives, she's created last mm. because I think God saves his best work for last. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he, he saves the one who is the life giver as the last, as kind of the, 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 the period at the end of the sentence. Mm. Right. I think I said last time the cherry on top of the whipped cream, right. That, mm. that is like, boom, <laughs> drop the mic. I created her, drop the mic done you know and, and so and, and we see this think think about this this is where the blessed virgin mary comes in the greatest ex and this is what i mean by i say in a sense women are in a quote unquote better than men mm. i mean they're not better than men but, mean, but saint, saint augustine actually if you read augustine makes the same argument right, right? uh when he, when he says priests and nuns are greater than married people he doesn't mean like it's a better like they're better than anybody because they're reflecting on earth what our life is going to be like with God forever in heaven. You see? And that's what a woman does for both, not just women, but also for men, right? Because remember the church is called what? She, the church is always referred to as feminine, which of course the church has men and women in it, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm not saying that, you know, men are women. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but when, when, but when Christ gives himself and gives life to the church and then to represent that, the, the 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 Christ part, the husband part, the bridegroom part, that's why we have priests. And the, and the men in the marriage relationship also represents Christ that way in the marriage relationship. But he's not better than she is, you know, uh, but but he's there to serve, protect and defend. Yeah. You see, so so she's created last. So Mary now think about it. When when God could have done anything that he wanted to bring salvation into the world. Jesus could have just showed up one day out of nowhere, like Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek, the, the, in Genesis 9, the dude shows up out of nowhere. You know, Ab Abram's fighting his battle. He's done. He wins. All of a sudden, Melchizedek shows up. 
He's like, who's this dude here? And so it, it, what is but what he recognizes, though, Abram recognizes the superior priesthood of Melchizedek and gives him tithes. And what does Melchizedek offer for those bread and wine? Right. So Melchizedek is an image of Christ in Psalm 110 ties that together beautifully in David's Psalm, Messianic Psalm uh, of fulfillment, Psalm 110. You are a priest forever. He's talking about the Messiah. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus could, just could have showed up like Melchizedek. No big deal, but no, God didn't want to do it that way. He came through a family. Why? Because Satan in Genesis 3 tried to destroy the family. And who did he go after first? The woman. So now God creates the most, the blessed of all women in a family as a vehicle to bring salvation into the world. Mm -hmm. You see? And that's why Joseph was important. I mean, think God could have said, Mary, you and me, we got this. Don't need no man. No, 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 no. Mm. That's not God's plan. That's not God's plan. So, so if some people say, well, why, if two people are the same sex, why can't they be together? I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of different types of families, right? So, for example, there's sometimes where they're divorced, like my family. My parents are divorced. Horrible marriage, my parents said. They're divorced. Yeah, but that's not by design. Most of those situations happen because of sad and tragic events. One of the spouses dies. That's a sad and tragic event. Now the other person's a widow, right? A, a very good friend of mine, a deacon, um, who actually we were in kindergarten class together. We know each other our, literally almost our entire lives, and we're both deacons now. His wife died a year and a half ago, like, like that. He came home, she was dead. Um completely and now see now he's now he's 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 by himself. that's a sad and tragic circumstance the, the fact that my parents are divorced or some mm. uh mm. people drink and, mm. and they split up those are sad and tragic circumstances not by design no one gets married saying well i can't wait till he hits me or i can't wait till she starts drinking and cheats on me no mm. nobody does that come on so so by god's plan and god's design he had a family, including Joseph. Now, Joseph wanted to extract himself, but the Lord said, no, we need you. We need you. Mm -hmm. And what was his primary job? Serve, protect, and defend as the king, because that's the main job of a king is to serve. See, we think kings are to rule, mm -hmm. to rule, to be in charge, to tell people what to do. No, the main job of a king was to serve. Look at the beautiful example of um of king uh was uh the great uh, uh saint who's a uh, was a uh, king in france you know this dude i mean he used to have beggars and lepers come into the royal palace a uh, saint louis saint louis of france he used to have beggars come in and he used to serve them at his table the king's table he used to wait on them and he ate their leftovers for his dinner. Wow. Wh what? That's what I'm talking about. That's the see. Now, obviously, he's a saint, right? He did it. He did that to an extreme. But that's the idea. His job is to serve, protect and defend. And that's how we rule. Right. Mm. Rule. It's not now interesting. The word in Genesis chapter 3, 16. We all know Genesis 3.15, right? The, the Proto-Evangelium of the first gospel. I'll put enmity. That's ebow in Hebrew, which, li which literally means hatred. I will put hatred or enmity or opposition between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, talking to the snake. The line after that is the temporal punishment for the woman. He says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing and pain. You should bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now, the word there is Maushal in Hebrew, which means to dominate like a tyrant. Oh, wow. Ah, see, so biblically, biblically, any man who's tries to abuse his wife physically, emotionally, sexually, spiritually, any other kind of way, that is a sad and tragic effect of original sin. Genesis 3.16 to rule over. That's not God's plan for us. That's why Ephesians 5, St. Paul brings us back on track. 
to what authentic family life is supposed to be like. And I think the greatest model in the history of the church of that is the Holy Family. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been reflecting on the Holy Family, obviously, in this consecration. And one thing that struck me is uh, I was thinking through the argument of like, um, often you hear a Protestant say, yeah, but you didn't need Mary. Just She just happened to be there. But the Catholic defense of that is like, yeah, but yeah sure god didn't need mary he didn't need anything he could have just clicked his fingers and salvation could have happened but he chose to and then he therefore also chose um joseph and he chose that they wouldn't have any other children because god's kind of efficient he uses what he needs and what he need there was no there was no purpose in in those two in mary and joseph having more children because there was a purpose in her perpetual virginity and there's a pur purpose in uh, joseph's chastity and from that that this is he wasn't he wasn't just creating a family he was creating the holy family which has a, a purpose and a and a reason for us to get to know god more um, no exactly right and um let's let's talk about the holy family for a second because you're right mary gets a well jesus of course he's the son of god duh right i mean without him there's nothing yeah but mary gets a lot of attention because she's the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the Theotokos, um, uh, the God-bearer. Uh, and and you're right, God, she was an integral part of God's plan. Didn't have to use her, but see what God was doing, he was undoing what Satan did. Yeah, Satan used a woman as a vehicle into the family to destroy the family. God's using the most blessed of all women as a vehicle to rebuild the family not but here's the beautiful thing it's not just the nuclear family it's the entire family of god which she symbolizes in her person she is the new ark of the covenant did i talk about that last time how she's the new ark of the covenant no okay so in the old ark of the covenant you think about the ark of the covenant in exodus there is only three first of all it talked about i mean if you look at the detail that went into building the ark. I mean, there's an entire chapter yeah. that just goes to how many rods, how many, you know, uh, uh, how much gold and how much this and how much that. And it had to be this many cubits and this many spans and this, I mean, very meticulous and detailed for only three things that went into the ark. And all three of those things represented the presence of God, the staff of Aaron, the mana, the, 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 the mana from heaven, um and the uh, um uh the manna from heaven the ark uh the uh, staff of aaron and um oh what was oh the ten commandments that's the, yeah. the uh 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 the 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 ten words of god uh right um so those were the only things that were inside uh the ark um now you look at fast forward to our blessed virgin mary um she's the new ark of the covenant and she was created, the, that's what we say, the Immaculate Conception. Not Jesus was conceived to her, but the way she was conceived to be built with that same kind of beauty and detail, except in a spiritual way, she was prepared for her conception to be that new Ark of the Covenant. What are the only three things inside of her, right? All represented by Jesus, the staff of Aaron, the staff represented his, his uh, he is the shepherd. Mm -hmm. And did Jesus say, I am the good shepherd? Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, John, uh, the, the manna from heaven, John chapter six, uh, your fathers ate the manna in the desert and they died. But he who is this bread will live, for, will live forever because the bread that I give you is my flesh for the life of the world. Right. And of course, the Ten Commandments, um, uh, the um, Aseret Hadibrot in Hebrew, the Aseret Hadibrot, the, literally the ten words of God. Jesus is the word that became flesh. And he summarized the Ten Commandments for us, right? Love God, right? And then love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the, 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 the Ten Commandments. And interesting, very interesting. If you go deeper into the Ten Commandments, there's the, 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 the love God is the first three. Love your neighbor as yourself is five through ten. You know, it's the fourth commandment that bridges the two. Right, because it's it's both. It's the only command that that encapsulates both love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And which what is number four? Honor your father and your mother. 
it's the only one that has a promise attached to it as well. You see, so see this right in the nature of how God created, not just creation, but even when he gave us the commandments, there's that beautiful uh, relationship between fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, built in, not into the very nature of who we are, but also built into the very laws of God. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things with uh, the faith is like the, st the second you start looking into it, and one of the things that drew me more into Catholicism is this: as you um, start reading it, start answering another question, another question comes up, and there's another answer because, and it all comes back to uh, the seminal document, the Word of God. It all comes back to Scripture eventually, and I feel like often we can feel so far removed from it because we're often given the theologian that expounded a teaching which made, led to a dogma or a doctrine of the church, but we forget that the re like. Um, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, I was listening to, I think, Scott Hahn, he was talking about um, how people often forget to read the Bible and, and inf instead read the Summa. And it's like, well, why don't you find out where the Summa came from and read the books that St. Thomas Aquinas read, which is the Gospels. Um, and we can, we can get to that heart of God. Um, and in the heart of God, we find Mary and Joseph. In Jesus so I was like I was wondering what does it take to be um, what does it take to be the heart of God what does it take to be the the the, the, the capsule uh, protector of the the heart because in uh, the consecration of st. Joseph he go they go through all the virtues when you're talking about st. Joseph in the litany like um, you know chastity um, prudence strength and all these things and these are great words and they're fun to say um, but like how do we live these things yeah that and that's where the rubber hits the road because if you're not living it then it then it doesn't mean anything it just they're just mm. words so let's first, first of all let's take a look at the contra the contributions of joseph first of all and the thing what makes joseph in a sense so obscure which i'm i'm grateful to father calloway um, who's a good friend of mine. We literally, we text each other every week, like oh. every week, you know, if I'm going to see him next week in Chicago. Um, but, 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 and he draws this out so beautifully. That's why his book is so incredible. In fact, he has things in that book that have never been in English before about Joseph. Yeah. That's what make, to me makes the book so spectacular. There's scholarship on Joseph and prayers and devotions and novenas that have never been in the English language. He got permission to, to put it in the English. Wow. But anyway, the first thing that Joseph contributes is his family, is his heritage. OK, if you look at Matthew's genealogy um, and that's why Matthew starts at genealogy, because he has to show that Jesus is descended from Abraham through David or else they won't listen to another thing he has to say. So the first thing Joseph gives to Christ uh, as the protective family is his family, is his, is his heritage. Um, because, again, we said what you're saying. Well, he wasn't his natural father. It didn't matter back then. It didn't matter. Right. If, if, you, if your brother died, then you were supposed to take – and you as the other brother is supposed to take over that family right. and raise the children as if they're your own. You know, so you are now the father of that family. They, legally, they didn't care whether you were the adoptive father or the biological father. Oh. Um, and, and but we make such a big deal about that today. Well, he's not really my kid. Yes, he's your kid. If you've adopted him, you accept the responsibility. So he's your child. Yeah. You know, we need to get away from this whole adopted mentality kind of thing. Um, so the other thing that Joseph contributes, because why? He doesn't say anything. There's no Joseph. There's no quotes from Joseph. Joseph never says anything. The second thing he gives to him is trust. Is trust. Um, Joseph trusted God again. He he wanted to. Well, there's two schools of thought. One was that when the um, before the angel came to him, he said he was going to divorce her quietly. Was that when she he found out she was pregnant, he said, "Oops, you know the the penalty for uh for adultery is being stoned to death." Actually, the man and the woman. You look at Le Leviticus chapter twenty verse ten and Deuteronomy twenty two twenty two clearly says the man and the woman is supposed to be stoned to death. So he's like, okay, I, instead of that, I don't want to subject her to that. I'll just do this quietly on the side. No big deal. That's one school of thought. But then I talked to some Josephologists and I, you know, some people even know there were Josephologists out there, but there are, 
Um, and this one guy was saying that he he thinks Joseph believed her and that God was doing something amazing and he wanted to divorce her so he can get himself out of the way so that God can do what God wanted to do. Oh. You see? Yeah. He didn't want to get in the way of what God was doing. I was like, wow, that's a cool way of thinking about it too. So I think, you know, I actually like that way better, yeah, right? Yeah. But the, but the main whether you believe one or the other doesn't matter. Here's the point: when the angel came, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. Don't be afraid. Mm. Right? God's got this, and, and Joseph, we need you. And and what does the scripture tell us? Joseph did everything God asked him to do. I'm not, that's what as men. When we, we, when we accept the responsibility of being husbands and fathers in a, in a domestic church mm. or being husbands and fathers in a parish, if you're a priest, yeah. right? There's responsibilities that come with that. Joseph understood that he was borrowing the sacred name of God, Father. Yeah, yeah. He was going to be a father of, of Jesus. Yeah. And the responsibility that comes with borrowing God's sacred name, right? And, and Joseph understood that. And the way we he showed how he understood that was by faithfully doing everything that God asked him to do. Imagine if every man kept his wedding vows to the letter, to the letter, that when your wife is getting on your last nerve, <laughs> and not only she on your last nerve, she's stepping on that last nerve, okay? <laughs> and, and, and you want to respond out of an emotion. You want to respond out of, you know, uh, why the hell did I even do this? You know, kind of a thing. But but the proper response is Joseph. Yeah. Right? And, and, and the way, and that's the second thing, this trust. The third thing is we need to enter into the silence of Joseph. Because Joseph was silent. Mm. And notice, the three times that the angel came to Joseph, what was Joseph doing each and every time when Gabriel came? Sleeping. Sleeping. There's something about stillness and silence and quiet where God speaks to us. And so as protectors, uh, ser servants, protectors, and defenders of our families, of the church, of the culture, we need to not be afraid to enter into that silence. Because right now, we live in a culture that's deathly afraid of silence. Mm. Every second has to be filled with noise or distractions. You know, um, uh, that's why I love Cardinal Sarah's book on the power of silence. You know, he's bringing us back to this very, if you read the book, it's very Carthusian. You know, the Carthusians are very, uh, they're basically um, hermits that live mm. in community. And there's a, a fun, if no one's seen this movie, you got to see it. It's phenomenal. Um, it's called Into Great Silence. Into Great Silence. Um, in fact, I think they have it on YouTube, the full movie. And it's not in English, but it has um, uh, subtitles that you can read in English. It's about the Carthusian way of life. It is phenomenal. And here's the interesting thing. There's hardly any words spoken. It's, the movie's two hours long. There's only very, very few words spoken in the entire movie. Oh, wow. So not much. <laughs> and I, and it's one of the best movies. I, it's one of the few movies I actually own. That's how much I liked it. Oh, wow. Because um, it, 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 it shows silence is beautiful. It's showing silence entering you, you, into God's space where your heart becomes united with God's heart. That's why Psalm 46, verse 11. Now, somebody, some people argue with me. What's well, verse 10? Nope, it's actually verse 11 because it's the, the superscript uh, count in, in the Masoretic text uh, of, the, of the Psalms. The, the prescript is, counts as one of the verses, right? So you know how they have those prescripts or instructions that says, um, for the choir master, a Psalm of Asaf, right? Okay. Which Asaf in Hebrew means gather. So um, that counts as a verse, but when but sometimes we translate it, the Bible into English, we leave out we leave out this the, the superscript and we just start with the uh, we start with the 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 main part of the Psalm. That's why some of you see it. It says Psalm uh, nineteen verse two. What's it you saying? So what happened to verse one? Well, verse one is the superscript. You see, anyway, that 
<laughs> getting nerdy there. Fun fact. Um, but entering into the entering into that beautiful sounds, be still and know that I am God. Someone, Psalm one nineteen, at midnight, I will rise and thank you for your just decrees. So not being afraid to enter into that silence. So if we're going to be kings, right, servants, if we're going to be priests to offer sacrifice, the sacrifice of our lives for our brides, the church, for our brides, our wives, our children, for the church and for the culture, we have to not be afraid to enter into that silent space, in, into the heart of Joseph, if you will, mm. and learn to listen to God in the silence the way Joseph did. That, I think, is the most underrated, beautiful gift that Joseph has given to the church and given to us as men, mm. is to enter into that space of silence, you know? Um, and I think that's what makes Joseph so great. And he's an incredibly powerful intercessor mm. uh, for us in heaven. And, and that's why Father Cowley's book is so incredible. I mean, people are like, wait a minute. There's like a rosary to Joe. There's a Joseph rosary. Wait a minute. There's this novena. Wait a minute. There's this. I, I had no idea yeah. that this stuff exists about Joseph, um, uh, because the attention is focused on Jesus, of course, and yeah. and, and then the Blessed Virgin Mary, the greatest saint in the history of the church, is a wife. By the way, is a wife and a mother, mm. not a priest or a bishop or a pope, a wife and a mother. <laughs> right? Wow. Come on, man. That, that, and see, and, and that's why when we say that like, women are greater or higher than men, like what Augustine talks about, that's what he means. He doesn't mean because when we hear that, we think we, we're thinking secular. Right. What do you mean? What do you mean? You know, I was just having a, a discussion with someone about this the other day about women's sports. Oh, yeah. We were when we were watching the Olympics because some of the events of the Olympics just started, and we were I forget what we were watching. And the, the person made the comment to me about, um, well, I don't see why they have to have everything separate. The, you know, oh, we're watching softball. We're watching softball. And the softball field is built onto the baseball field in, in, in Tokyo where the, where the uh, softball. But, but they, the this field is much smaller for the women. Oh. You see? It, it, the, the, the pitching mound is moved forward. The bases are they, – they had to create like a, a field within the field. Okay. And I said, well, that, that's not fair. They should just play on the regular field like the men do. I'm like, no, that won't work um, because women aren't as strong as men. Now, of course, when I said that, she got this person got offended. Now, I didn't. I, what I meant by that was not like spiritually stronger because I, I, uh, I think in a lot of ways women are more spiritually stronger than men, um, especially we have to push a baby out and all that kind of stuff, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> but. Um, but I, I was talking about in the, in the physical sense. Why? Because a man is built by his very nature, built to serve, protect, and defend that beautiful heart of love. Right. Mm. So, so that's why you have women's sports and men's sports different from each other. Not because the women can't do what the men do. Uh, it's because they're, they're physically they they they're not at that same level. That's yeah. why. And that, and, and that's why it's, the scary thing about this whole transgender movement is going to destroy women's sports because you get these men who are still physically men who, for some reason, believe they're women competing in women's sports and they're, and they're crushing it. They're, they're crushing all the women mm. because they're really men. So, oh, he's taking testosterone blocker. Look, you could take all the stuff you want. You still a man mm -hmm. and you're still going to physically outperform. That's just, I mean, that's just the nature of how God created things. Why? Not out of some sense of domination over the woman. No, to honor, to, to honor God in that gift that he was given. So the way he serves, protects, and defends is for God's honor and God's glory. Any man that uses his strength to hurt a woman, to belittle a woman, to make himself seem better than her. Then again, that goes back to Genesis 3, the punishment, Malshaw. Um, to, to, to dominate like a tyrant. That is not God's plan. Mm. So Joseph, I think, is a beautiful, I think he's a quintessential example of fatherhood in the scriptures um, because his actions spoke louder than his words. Yeah, yeah. Something I was reflecting on in uh, doing this consecration is the power, um, as power, as you might want to call it, um, because... You know, they talk about how obviously Jesus is the most powerful, 
and then Mary is more powerful powerful than Joseph but only because of Jesus but because of how Jesus is she has that power but she only has it because of Jesus but then again with Saint Joseph it's one step removed but the same exact reason the reason Joseph has any authority over Mary and uh, Jesus is because they give it to him but they also are subject to it because they give it to him and it's just that ah it's just so like beautiful like kind of togetherness like trinitarian kind of love uh but like it doesn't take away anything from it but it adds to it it's like the reason you are powerful and you are more powerful than all of us is because we allow you to be not in a kind of we could take it away from you but then in the we want to be under you uh even though he is i guess maybe you could say uh objectively the lesser of the three um but then yeah i just i love what you were saying there about the um this balance of power is that there is two types of power the power that god gives us and the power that we try and create for ourselves which comes from genesis original sin and like cause i'd never i'd never heard that before and it just it just puts the cherry on the cake it makes everything make sense of like this when we try and grasp for power it turns into tyranny because we can't, oh that is so good we can't hold it that we is so good what it. you just said right there mm. well that's that's it right there i mean think about it like this um the power thing now husbands and wives are supposed to make decisions together yeah duh right and make decisions together that's what you do but every at least in our family every once in a while there's a decision that has to be made that we can't decide together. Mm. So she'll defer to me. Now, why does she do that? Because she's not smart. Oh, my wife's plenty smart. She's a psychologist. She has degrees. She has all this stuff. She's plenty, plenty smart. Um, but, but because she does that, because again, she gives me that power, right? To make the decision but she, because she knows Every decision that I make is going to be in her best interest and the best interest of the children, mm. not for myself. Mm. That's see, she could take that to the bank, right? Because she and that's and that's what happened in the Holy Family, right? Joseph, I think about it, God had to listen to Joseph, <laughs> right? Because when and we know that that's true, because after the finding in the temple. It says that Jesus that G, that Jesus was obedient to them, and the word there in Latin is obedire, which means listen. So literally, says he he listened to them, mm -hmm. not just okay. I'm gonna, if you tell me to eat my peas, I'm gonna no. He listened to it with the ear of his heart. Yeah, with the ear of his heart. You see, so God allowed Himself because He saw He understood and placed Himself under Joseph's role as the as the head the spiritual head as the king as the priest in that family and you know and god allowed him to be taught by joseph you know he had to learn his hebrew he had to learn his prayers yeah he had to learn his carpentry skills he learned from his father and god sub and, and the son second person trinity subjected himself to that mm. um why because he wanted God, Jesus wanted to have the full breath of human experience. Because think about it, it says, was it in Mark's gospel? He did not teach them unless he spoke in parables. So how do you, how do you get that understanding of parable story? That's based on real stuff, mm. right? You, you look at the um, you look at the, the examples he gave from uh, from work the work life from the agrarian culture that was around him, from uh, the carpentry that was around him, from relationships and power struggles between people. And he used those things that people can relate to that they see every day um, uh, uh, to, to get the point of cross is how God, of how God is trying to teach them. You see, now, if Jesus appeared out of nowhere, he wouldn't have that context. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have that context. But but having grown up in that family and learned, he, could, he has the full breadth of human experience that he drew from as part of his three-year ministry, you know, and, and, and that's, and that's cool. And get, how, where did he get that? From the family. He grew up in a family to bring the whole family of God together. 
yeah that's beautiful it's really powerful uh and like i think this again another one of these topics we could just keep going deeper and deeper because like uh especially with saint joseph the uh, tip of the iceberg is only just being delved into unfortunately we have again run out of time um <laughs> <laughs> there's so much more to talk about but if you want the details on this there's there's books there's the uh, there's the consecration to saint joseph a lot of the stuff we were talking about today is in this book uh there's the bible yep there's uh and then there's the consecration to uh, to jesus through mary and just mariology um we'll have to have more um episodes on uh this topic but just because there's so much to talk about and i feel like there's so much more to talk about but um... yeah well, and i think it's important what you said there about the consecration right for all these consecrations because i've heard some people criticize father calloway's book because consecration to joseph no it's always consecration to jesus yeah. through joseph or through we're not consecrating ourselves to joseph but and that's not what he meant yeah, right yeah, yeah. all the no, saint faustina saint it doesn't matter saint Therese of Lisieux, we're consecrating ourselves to jesus through them mm. okay mm. not causing our, ourselves to them and just kind of leaving jesus i just want to make that clear because some people sometimes get a little bit confused about that no it's a very important distinction to make um but yes um so you've got your book that you're finishing off when will that be finished uh well i submit the manuscript in october and then uh, my sense is is that they may get it out quickly Okay. Like by early, oh. early, early next year, Very tough. Um, because uh, this is a topic that's hot right now. Mm. And um, I've given webinars on this issue and they've been very, very well received. And so that's why they want me to kind of turn what I've been because I've been thinking about this during the whole COVID and, and the incidents that happened here in the United States um, with, that started a lot of the racial issues. And so I've been approaching this from a Catholic perspective. And so I'm turning to a book. So hopefully about it'll be out early next year. But as soon as I know uh, when it's going to be released, I'll let you know. Yeah, and we'll uh, get you back on and talk about it because I'm really, really interested to uh, get the Catholic perspective on these things because we need it. <laughs> um, yeah, excellent. But so, yeah, so thank you for joining me, uh, Deacon, and uh, for everybody else out there in the world listening to us. Thanks for listening and thanks for getting involved in Evangelion and our mission to spread the gospel around this great nation in New Zealand. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Deacon for coming on and for you guys for tuning in. So if you, again, you want to find out more information about what we do, check out our website, evangelion.co.nz. We actually have a retreat going on on Labor Weekend in October in Christchurch. So if you're in Christchurch and you want to go to our retreat, we ran on one in Auckland in, earlier in the year. It was amazing. Everyone loved it. You can have it in Christchurch. It's there on Labor Weekend. So check out our website, get the details there. And like, share, subscribe, give us good ratings on all the podcast apps and stay curious, stay Catholic and God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Deacon Harold's Walk by Faith Wednesday webinar. Tune in next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for more.